Hey all, happy to be here. I'm Jan, I'm uh, one of the founders of Jogo. Um, we focus on the voice space. And as this is a, like a messaging and voice meetup, I just wanted to have some quick hands. Like who of you has experience with like building stuff for either Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant? A lot, quite a lot, cool. Um, nice, okay, cool. So uh, something about, so we're two founders. Um, we're based in Berlin and um, we went through um, a program called um, Voice Camp last year, hosted by PeterWorks in New York. Um, we were one of eight teams working on the voice space. And while we were um, in this program, we started working on, uh, on Jovo, which is an open source framework that lets you build applications that work for both Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant. And uh, I will mostly talk today about the differences uh, for building for uh, Alexa and Google Assistant, like what's the design implications, like are there any technical limitations and stuff like that. But um, I also wanted to give a quick introduction why um, we believe it's important to build for both platforms. And um, I mean, most of you have noticed that there is some, some kind of race going on right now. It's like um, a, a land grab, basically, where the platforms think they need to be the first one to be inside your home and own that like, precious like, real estate in your home. And um, like, this was a slide I showed at most of my talks last year, um, during the end of the year, um, where I had to modify this like at every talk because so many things changed and I don't give talks very often, but um, there's um, like so many different devices that are um, that are added by both companies and as you can see, oh, I guess well, like this is supposed to be the home part here. <laughs> it, um, it had to be like during like the third modification, it had to be pushed out um, of 2017. And the prediction was that um, 40 million smart speakers were going to be sold until the end of 2017. And I'm not sure if this is still, like, if this is true. Like, who of you owns an Alexa-enabled device? Who of you owns, like, a Google, like, not the smartphone, but a Google smart speaker? Okay, who of you, like, uses both? Okay, like, Studies say there's like 8% um, of people that have both platforms. Um, today it was more than 8%, but they also have the feeling that more and more people have both um, devices. So, um, so there's something interesting happening here is um, like there were actually a lot of devices sold, um, obviously. Um, I myself, like, it's like people were even calling it the perfect lazy Christmas present. <laughs> so, like, I like I gave my parents, my grandparents, and my uncle an Echo Dot, for example. So it's like um, the perfect Christmas present. But also, um, Google uh, Google shares more data than Amazon, but also Google apparently sold like six million home devices. So there is a lot going on, and people thought that Amazon like won the race already. But there's other studies um, that predict that Google will win more and more market share from Amazon. Um, so I'm not sure if this study is going to turn out true. Um, I think this is quite a difficult number. I think even like the whole 12% in 2018 is a difficult number. Um, and, but still, um, this is something very interesting and um, like I'm using Google Assistant on my phone almost every day. So it's really, I believe there will be a lot happening. A lot of the different platforms competing. And the question is, will this be an iOS Android moment all over again? Like, will people like have to wait for their favorite app to be um, to be available on Google Assistant, which was available on Alexa um, way before and stuff like that? So, developers uh, should currently ask themselves like, what platform should I build for? What are the main opportunities of both platforms? And uh, I will talk a little bit about the, the platform ecosystems and the differences um, between the platforms and then we'll also do a little pitch uh, for Jovo. Sorry about that. Um, so if we look at the, the developer ecosystems, um, Alexa currently has like, um, when we talk about the quantities, um, Alexa has way more skills available. 
um, so in the US, I think th these numbers are from January. I read the numbers somewhere like more than 30,000 skills available. So there's a lot of skills available there. Google Assistant um, only has 1,700, but they haven't been focusing on quantity a lot. And, but still, they have been growing faster than Alexa skills in the last few months. So these numbers don't like speak for themselves, but um, it's obvious that currently Amazon has the larger developer ecosystem because they're also rewarding people for developing um, like high-performing Alexa skills, for example. They have monthly payouts and stuff like that. And even if you look at the developer Slack communities, it's obvious that right now Alexa with 1800 is still like the more active community if you want to use that as a, as a metric. Um, Cortana with 40, so we were proud uh, last month to cross Cortana with our global developer community, uh, which was our main goal for 2017. And um, so for us at, um, at Chovo, we decided to first only support Amazon Alexa and Google Home because they're the more consumer facing voice platforms. Um, Microsoft Cortana is like, I wouldn't like write them off for now because there's definitely some like opportunities on the business side and, and B2B markets, but uh, for us it was important to like first support only Amazon Alexa and Google Assist. So, and um, I will quickly like talk about, like there are so many people that have experience with Alexa and Google Assistant, so I will probably skip like many things here. Um, so to talk about the methodology, um, you probably all know that, that there's like different namings for the different platforms, like on Alexa they're called skills, on Google they were called actions on Google a lot, but they have been changing that, they, they have been like shifting to apps on Google Assistant recently, um, so they, they need to like try to change the wording there on the Google side. And uh, for us, we just call them voice apps, um, just to make it like, simple. And, um, and yeah, so you know that, like how it works. Um, I was, uh, this is like some more of the basic information that we're building apps for Google Assistant um, that was previously called the Google Action. And what's interesting um, about Google when you compare to Alexa um, is um, Alexa does the language model like it's a built-in Alexa uh, software or natural language understanding um, software. With Google, uh, most people use an integration um, which is called Dialogflow, which does the natural language understanding, which is previously called API.ai. And so let's talk about language models first. Um, so a quick recap is um, usually voice app has three elements. You have a person talking to the smart speaker, then afterwards <laughs> The voice platform does first, uh, like, let's say, speech to text, and then afterwards, it's natural language understanding, like what, uh, what did the person actually mean? And then the voice app actually comes into place. Um, it's the fulfillment section, which, which is done in your code, where people like react or send responses based on an intent that was sent from the natural language understanding platform. And so you can see here that for Google Assistant, Dialogflow is doing the NLU where Alexa does it all with its built-in platform. And for Alexa, it looks like this. It just, they just changed this. I had to rewrite every tutorial we have because they like with new screenshots. And they just changed this a few days ago. Um, so, and so there it looks like this, and then we have Dialogflow here. Um, so it's, it looks pretty similar, um, and mostly it is similar. They have a few differences, so for both platforms they're called intents. On Alexa, the sample phrases are called utterances, while Dialogflow just calls them like user says, like what does the user say. And um, on Alexa, like a variable, like parts of a sentence are called slots, where on Dialogflow they're called either entities or parameters. That's it. Um, and so to quickly talk about a few like um, differences um, here as well, like on Alexa, Alexa offers a lot of built-in intents and built-in slots that you can use to like quickly prototype language models, um, which Dialogflow doesn't support built-in intents, um, as far as I know. But the, the main opportunity with Dialogflow is that it returns the raw text the person says. 
like as soon as you publish your Alexa skill, you, you don't actually get any information what the person said. You only get an intent that was mapped um, from the user interaction. So um, this is one of the main advantages of Dialogflow is that it returns raw text that you can use to then like adjust your model and train it. And um, one more thing about Dialogflow is it has a lot of like context information, so it can tell Dialogflow what types of intents you're expecting. So if you ask a question and you only expect like a color, for example, then it would just um, then it would just trigger a color or would look more actively for that color. Um, which Alexa doesn't support. So we have, if you have a complex Alexa interaction model, um, we previously built a skill for a singer, and for example, we once asked for states, um, like US states, like Oklahoma, for example. But the singer also had um, a song title called Oklahoma Christmas. And so whenever like people said, tell me more about the song Oklahoma Christmas, it would just map to the state of Tantle, which is say, oh, the person's at Oklahoma. <laughs> And that's it. So there's a lot of stuff that like you then have to do like like hard coded like redirects and stuff like that, which that also makes it a little easier to to adjust for certain questions. And um, there's also a lot of design considerations um, which we didn't think about when we first started developing our framework. So we first thought, okay. Let's just build once and deploy to both platforms, but we're more and more thinking about how can we offer features that allow people to build for platform specific interactions, just because it's like it's different framing on both platforms. On Alexa, it's called skill. You're teaching Alexa a new skill when you're developing a skill for Alexa. It's still the Alexa voice. Um, game developers often frame it like that. You're playing a game against Alexa. That stuff like that doesn't happen um, on Google Assistant, where Google Assistant is more like a moderator. Um, someone from Google once said, it's more like a dinner party, where people like stand together, some of the networking here, and then if you ask that person a question and they don't know the answer, they're like bringing in someone else, like asking, hey, do you know about this? And then they're bringing in another person into the conversation. So it's like um, voice apps on Google, for example, have a different voice even, like they don't have to speak in the Google Assistant voice. So there's like the, there's really differences in how branding works on both platforms that need to be considered. On Alexa it's difficult for brands to have their own voice. It's still like difficult to distinguish from Alexa. On Google Assistant it's a little easier. But also like more like a, a break. Hello? Okay. Um, and there's an example of that, like how it works. Like uh, if you like open, let me talk to Akinator. Um, it even opens Akinator here, and the, like it says chatting with Akinator. It shows the Akinator like icon. So there's a real distinction between Google Assistant and the actual app. And Amazon's great at like at owning the home. Um, it's like they they built devices for the nightstand, for the kitchen for the living room and stuff like that. So for, for Amazon, that's a clear advantage um, to have the distribution um, to, to, to bring devices cheaply into people's homes and design for that. Um, what we think is extremely important uh, when designing voice applications is context. So smart speakers in the home, they're mostly like morning, like getting ready devices or like having the family around the table devices. Um, but what happens in between, like what happens when people leave the work, uh, leave, leave the home, are on the go, and this is where Google is great. This is where Google with Google Assistant, but I switched from, from an iPhone to, to a Pixel phone, mostly because of the squeeze function, like I'm talking to my phone more than I'm actually typing, um, which might like, be weird in public. Um, but it's like a, a main advantage compared to Alex. They are also like on the go. It's a consistent experience. Um, so there's there's more and more features, and so there there is no standard. There is no one voice app. So there are main advantages that both platforms have. Like Google Assistant is sometimes more like a chatbot. Um, if it's running on the phone, where Alexa has all these different devices, they have gadgets, they have Echo Show. Um, so this is really something to consider when designing your voice application. And that also brings me to a main point that I learned during the last few months is 
that there are a lot of great um, voice user interface designers, um, but what we learned is um, that it's extremely important to also think about the technical limitations of the platforms. That there's, they all have the differences in language models, they have the differences in how the platforms work, and that's why we think that developers and designers need to collaborate early on in the design process. So we, we believe that's such a thing as a developer handoff where someone designs a flowchart and then hands it over to a developer, stuff like that doesn't work on voice interfaces. We need better feedback processes and tools to do that. And we're trying to work with tools to support this. Um, so to uh, time. So to um, to recap, um, we we just talked about the, the differences for code. Um, Alexa is usually hosted on Lambda, where Google is hosted on Google Cloud Functions. Um, so you have two different code bases, and that's exactly how we started out with the Jovo framework to um, to remove that redundancy that people have to build two different code bases hosted on two different platforms and all of that. And that's what um, the Jovo platform does. But let's uh, let's see. Like, what do you think? What's a better platform to develop for right now? Can you show some good hands for Alexa? And also for Google, a lot of like no hands. Like, for this list. Um, so, what is for Cortana? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, okay. So, so again, Google, uh, Alexa is great at the home and e-commerce and at the like cloud infrastructure, where Google is great at like the whole ecosystem of different apps. That they have a great maps integration. They have like um, they own the phone basically for people not using iPhones. And they have like a lot of data, which also showed quick, that they were able to roll out to more and more countries more quickly than, uh, than Alexa. So let's just talk quickly about the Jovo framework. So this is, again, this is an open source free framework. We started building that in May. We officially launched it in, in September. And um, what we want to do is we want to simplify the development experience for this app. So not only cross-platform, we also saw that there's in the development workflow, there's a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of like uploading code to Lambda, then using terrible CloudWatch logs to figure out um, stuff. Like there's a lot of things that weren't great while developing it, but we realized while we were building Alexa skills, and so we thought, okay, let's just build a framework. And um, so um, if you look at this, like how it used to be with Jovo, we were, we've been mostly focusing on the code part and the fulfillment. So we allow people to build the code base once, upload wherever they want. Um, but also, we want to, with integrations, we want to enable um, more and more tools to be part of the ecosystem and enable users to build great voice applications with simple integrations and so to not add a lot of overhead <laughs> while like adding analytics. And still, people had to go to Dialogflow and Alexa to build language models, and that was our number one requested feature. And we are finally, like, we launched it last week. We haven't publicly announced it yet. We're launching version one of our framework, which was a, a big step for us to um, with a lot of different features. But the number one feature is that we now have an abstracted Jovo language model, <coughs> which uses our CLI to convert them into a Dialogflow model or an Alexa model and push it to the platforms. We also added some new templates, and uh, what we also did for a better development experience, we added a Jovo webhook that allows people to easily um, develop locally. Um, we used a tool like Ncroc before, but now it's a simplified and seamless experience. Um, I would quickly um, walk through this. So how it works is, People use our CLI to create a new project. Um, it's downloaded. And um, to take a little second look at the code, how it, how it looks like. Um, so for us, it's important to have like to. So here's so this is um, this is how the logic looks like in our code. So it's like very simple. Um, it's like you have different intents and then tell um, like ask something or tell something. And so this is how we want to make it as easy as possible to possible to prototype something. It's also very close to the Alexa skill framework. 
And this is the um, Jordan language model. So people only have to maintain a local JSON file. And um, I'm changing the invocation here to, to my test app, for example. And then people can use um, people can use our CLI to initialize a platform project, for example, an Alexa skill. Um, this will then create um, an app.json file where we store the information, like it's an Alexa skill um, with the built-in NLU Alexa, and this is the Jovo webhook. Um, and then we're creating the platform-specific um, models, and let me just put this bit over, and we're then deploying it to the platforms here with Turbo Deploy. And this step usually takes a little longer because uh, we're waiting until the platform is, uh, until the model is built. And um, so our goal was that people can quickly build an Alexa skill in a Google action without leaving the command line, just to have something happen quickly. And with our templates, to also have more advanced interactions and see how, how it looks like. So yeah, let, me, let me just skip this. And then people can use Jovo Run to run a development server. And you can see here, this is again the webhook link. And if you then go to the Alexa developer platform, you can see that there's <coughs> Hello World, which just created. And if you then test it, This works as well with uh, dialogue flow, and this is how we want to make it as easy as possible for people to build for cross-platform uh, apps. And uh, for us, what we learned while developing it is that it's important to have platform-specific features. So it's not like a like common denominator kind of thing uh, because like the platforms are different. And um, that's probably it. If you want to learn more about voice app development with our framework or in general, we offer a few, um, a few courses on jovo.tech slash learn. And also we have a Slack community and now more people than Microsoft Cortana on jovo.tech slash Slack. Um, thanks a lot. Um, um, I hope that wasn't too much like on the coding part, um, but happy to answer any questions either like here or just later if you want to. Like ask more about the like, developer specific stuff. Or is, is that you? Yes. <laughs> nice. Valued member of our community sitting here. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, you mentioned Alexa and um, Google. Any plans for Apple? They just released their uh, their device. So, like Siri. Apps work differently. Like um, they come with a mobile app. They are tied to a mobile app, uh, so it's not an, a platform as open as Alexa and Google Assistant. As soon as they open up up the platform, and we actually hoped that they were going to do it last year at WWDC in, in May, but they didn't. So hopefully this year they're going to open it up. It doesn't seem like it right now. A lot of people have lost their trust in like I don't know. If you've seen re uh, like previous reviews for the Apple HomePod, for example, like it isn't that great actually. Like um, I'm still like I'm a Mac user. Uh, I have an iPad, um, but it's like even I, as a like an Apple fanboy, switch to Google Assistant, for example. So I still think they might be able to turn it around. But until today, there's no no way to build a great like voice application for Siri. Um, just in terms of the speech uh, recognition, sort of, what's your view on the you know, comparison of quality between the Google and Amazon and Alexa? So, what people say is that Alexa understands them better than Google, but I think that's just the smart speakers. So, apparently, Google uh, Alexa has better like better microphones and their smart speakers. Um, but what, like, in my personal opinion, um, the Google speech recognition works better than Alexa. Like, if you use the new like testing interface 
on Alexa, um, it displays, like similar to Google Assistant, it displays, like it tries to transcribe what you're saying while you're saying it. It's terrible, like never, like not a single word is without like a wrong understanding um, and transcription. Uh, why do those systems, when I'm talking to them, my phone transcribes almost every sentence like perfectly. Um, so I think um, that Google is better there. Anyone else? Anyone else? Hey there. So I've, uh, I've been playing with uh, Samsung Bixby for the last couple of months, mm -hmm. and my experience has been pretty poor. So what, what are they getting wrong? Why, why does it not understand me? Why does it make this cause? Is it my northern accent? Is that what it is? Could it have been so I've got an Alexa for Christmas and it understands my Scottish partner? Absolutely perfect. So why are they getting it so wrong? Whereas all the other tools we discussed are getting it so right. Um, I've never tried Bixby. <laughs> um, I heard that they are they haven't integrated VIF yet. Like everyone was like looking forward after the VIF acquisition. Like for like for some context, like WIF was the startup that previously created Siri, and then like Siri was acquired by Apple, and then afterwards they started working on WIF, and it was like amazing demos out there. Then Samsung acquired them and like shut it down and like promised they would um, integrate WIF, um, but. They have managed to integrate it yet, um, but apparently they're working on it. Um, so I don't know if that would make it better, but <coughs> let's let's see. 